I um, um, had made a mistake last week, and maybe we could just just start here. So, um, in in the instructions on the GitHub, there's a way to fork the repo and pull the content and edit it locally. And I I supplemented what the last cohort had with some additional stuff. Um, and I'll have more new today. Um, would you and, would you mind show, showing us how to maybe before to before starting with the lab uh, okay. how to push the thing um, with the GitHub? Thanks. Yes. Okay. So, um, and and maybe you're all experts, but I'll I'll just share my learning journey, <laughs> and and maybe you can laugh at me. <laughs> so. Um, out at the, I assume you can see my screen. Yeah, we see. Yeah. So at the GitHub, if, if you search R4DS GitHub, um, the, the, the core R4DS has, has many of these book clubs. And of course we're in ISLR. Um, there's um, a front page of our GitHub and, and lots of dates and plans, but the instructions of course are at the bottom. And uh, these are pretty clear. I, I was able to follow them um, pretty well. I, uh, you know, I have a good GitHub. I forked the repository. So I, in the upper right, I, I touched fork. Fork makes essentially that repo in, in my, my Opus GitHub. So, so it, it becomes visible to me. And then um, uh, locally, I created a new project in our studio. Um, I did the dependencies. I installed the things related to the project. I made a branch. Um, I wonder if it still appears here. Yeah, I, I, for my case, I called it ISLR cohort two, but you can call it anything in your own repo. Um, I edited the chapter file. So in my case, chapter two, and, and in, the, in the book down, you, you each will have your own chapters. Um, incidentally, I, I added some other packages that we'll talk about today. So I use this handy, use this um, helper um, so that the, when it builds the book, it grabs those packages and, and, and is able to build the book properly. Um, I committed changes, but let me explain my mistake. So I'm going to switch to R. The, um, the code chunks are nicely labeled or other people labeled like O2 dash setup, O2 dash library. And, and when the build, when the book is being built, if there's a error in knitting the markdown, it tells you the code chunk where the error was, except, and this is my mistake, I didn't name mine. <laughs> yeah. So if there was a problem, you know, in, in, in GitHub Actions in building the book, it would say chunk number six. And uh, the, the person out, uh, you know, John or someone else who's building the book someday, maybe one of you, um, you would have more difficulty figuring out which chunk failed. <clears throat> And so labeling the chunks is helpful. And I, so John, um, when I when I did the pull request to get this pushed back into um, the master, John wrote to me saying, "Oh, by the way, <laughs> label your code chunks." Um, so in any case, I, I suppose you all knew that already. I mean, I it's a, a good reminder. I never name my code chunks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess it's um, uh, it's okay. So I, I learned something in that in that case. 
so I, for the uh, for another book club, I, I was going through the Happy Get With Our book um, sequentially, and everything seemed to be going fine. Um, and then I got really excited that things were coming together, and I forgot to branch. Um, and so, and then I don't know. It's I guess John just ignored my pull request. I don't know. Nothing's really happened since then. But um, I now I kind of think I know what I did wrong. But um, maybe you can clarify. So for the um, and that was one thing that was confusing about the book, which was which is great. But then sometimes. Um, you don't like have a visual of what they're describing or, or, or it's, it's hard to go from like using the art studio to not our studio and back. And so for branch, I know there's, it was either in uh, the shell or command line, but it shows a command and it to, to do to, to name the branch. Right. And then all of a sudden it's a different, it's a branch. And then you right, do the thing and then you do the command to, to bring it back to main and then you would submit the request, right? And then, so then if you're making additional updates to it, you have to then branch out again and then back in, <laughs> or does that make sense? It's, it's interesting. I think when I built my pull request, I was able to, um, I think I was able to do the pull request from uh, my branch in my repo to John's main. And, and maybe that's wrong too, but John allowed me. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but yeah, it, it was, it was the pull request was back at R4DS and, and I had the drop downs. Now, since then it's all been synced up. So there's nothing to, uh, <laughs> nothing to do pull requests for because I went and pulled across everything. But, um, I, I've not made further edits, but um, I so guess I could, if we... So you can do a branch and then work from that branch, commit from that branch, do the pull thing to bring in bring in new stuff as you need, and you're never committing back to main. You're just using... Jim, shall we, shall we um, jump into R and like um, do uh, a new project again, for example? Can you well, do that? If we have time, I mean. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's go through the the book content. <laughs> okay. And, and then see where we are. And and I would admit I'm I'm not a good expert, but but usually like uh, John's been very helpful for me. If okay, if I need something. Uh, it's like... Okay. Um. Give me uh, like uh Jim. Uh, uh um, Pardon me. Give me five minutes. Uh, just leave me the screen. Uh, I do this thing. Uh, five minutes. It's uh, ten past five uh, in Italy. <laughs> I don't know what time. Like like five minutes to show this thing, uh, and then we go forward. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so so I've got some few <laughs> few things open. Okay, so this is R. Let's say that. Um, okay, I, I, I've, I've done what Jim said about forking the, the GitHub, uh, but we do that again. Say uh, that we go to GitHub, close these things, and uh, maybe this is better if I do this. And I go on Slack, click on the GitHub um, link, and now I am in, uh, in the book club, okay? So I do the fork. Uh, when I do the fork, uh, it, um, so it's, it's supposed every one of you has a GitHub account, isn't it? So that you, you open an account with GitHub, okay? Uh, then you uh, go to, to Slack, click on the link uh, GitHub, 
then it opens up the GitHub pa uh, page for the book club and you fork it as I've just done it. So you fork it and automatically position it the book club in your account. So now this is your fork. Okay, so you basically have replicated the book club onto your account. Now you have this uh, address with your account and the book club thing. When you go on, uh, you then go back to R, what do you need to do is to like, Okay, so you now are in, in, into your R. You do project and new project. If you don't see it, or in, there's something else, just uh, interrupt me and say, you do uh, version control and then Git. Here you have uh, a space for URL. Where, uh, this is the, the space where you put the address of your fork. So you take the, oh, oh, sorry. So you take, you take this uh, and go back to R. You just copy that down, then copy the book hub and automatically position the name in here. You choose the location. Let's say that I, I position it somewhere else, different where I, where already is in my, in my R. So I put it just in R, okay? So now it's in R and then I say create project. What it does is downloading all the content from the, the fork in GitHub and loading in your R. So you have the book in your R. It takes a few, few minutes. Uh, not, mm, not much long, so not very long. Uh, then you have uh, all uh, the, the entire book club in your, for, in, in your R. At that point, you choose the file belonging to uh, the chapter that you are working on. Open up the R markdown for the chapter you want to present. And uh, you might want to save that R markdown, there we go. So it's opening up a new project. Okay, now this is, uh, I, I don't know if you can see, this is the, the fork, okay, of, the, of our book club. So this is chapter two, chapter three, uh, whatever. You have uh, here, uh, it's all done, eh? all set, all, you don't need to do anything else. You have Git tab on top of here. You have uh, uh, a commit bo uh, button, a push and pull, or pull and push. And then you have uh, this main thing is your branch. Okay, this is your branch. If we go back to, uh, where is it? Uh, the, the, uh, the fork, you see that this is the, the branch main. This is my main branch, okay, for my account. What I need to do for uh, pushing my changes, is to create a new branch, okay? So to create a new branch, I click here, this, this icon and say, I don't know, uh, Federica's um, branch, okay? And I click create. I don't do that now because it, it's not, Okay, uh, th this branch, you, you, you just click create and you will find this branch listed here. So you have like 
uh, all the main, which is yours, and the, the one that you have just created. Basically, there's, it's a mirror. So you have uh, um, all, all these things replicated within all the branches. So you can make change uh, in one branch and not in, in another. But I suggest you to work uh, all the time within your new branch so you can make modifications. So if, for example, you open up the R Markdown for chapter two, where you want to make the changes and work on and push your changes. I suggest you to save, like if you go here, file and save us, to save this R Markdown differently, like, I don't know, uh, like this chapter, uh, Two again, okay. So in a way that you have your uh, thing, you can then delete everything, modify, uh, but you still have it here because you need to have the file, the R markdown within in this directory, not somewhere else. So then you can make all the changes that you want, you delete, modify, whatever you want, but at the same time you can knit it and you find all your changes blended inside the other, the book, the, the, the book notes. Okay. So now I can find this, this, uh, this thing. Uh, where did I put it? Uh, I have two of these ones. So one is the, this one is the one I've just changed it because I've, I've deleted all the learning objectives. Okay. So enough that you change the name of the R Markdown and you, uh, but you have the file, which is this one here inside the same directory of the, the whole book down. Is a book down already built it with some files and everything. So when you need it, it will position it inside the book down so you can present it. Then if you want to push your changes, so you, uh, the thing is that John, uh, so the, the guidelines, uh, let's say like this, are to blend the notes together. So you should, uh, modify the, the main file, adding uh, things inside here. And then what do you do is uh, that you find your changes here, your changes here, you click this thing, and then you commit it. When you commit it, this, this page, uh, this screen open, opens up and you add the message here. These are, um, say, I don't know, chapter two notes, and then you commit. I suggest you to pull all the time before committing, to pull down all the time first, because of any changes within the main fork will be downloaded uh, within your uh, fork. And then commit, after you have committed, you need to push it because you committed in, in the meaning that you are committing the changes inside the, the server and then you push it, your changes in the main branch from your new branch, the branch that it's new and you have just made it. So this way, the main fork, not, not, uh, so you'll find the things in here as well, but the main fork will receive your push. And when you go there to see, you see your name and a green band on top, which says, uh, Federica uh, pushed something. You want to, um, what did it say, Jim? Help me uh, commit a, a pull request, say, so he asks you to, to do a pull request. So you click the green button that appears in here and he will 
um, basically um, send the thing for um, being revisited by the, the, the by the one who is the maintainer of the the main fork. So the not the the <laughs> of the book club of the notes. Okay. So I don't know. Um, is that clear a bit? Have you got any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's really clear. Uh, I guess the only part I was confused. So you're you're commit you're committing in pushing from your branch, and then I, I guess the only part I'm a little bit confused about is so then once you do once you push, you go back to the the main repo, and you have to click on something there too. Because you 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 do you commit and then push then you need to go to your fork reload the page and you'll find your changes but at the same time uh, he says on the main uh, uh, book club notes uh, um, on the main github of the book club notes um, that you if you go there and look because it leads you automatically but there, there would be a, a green, light green band with your name on it saying, commit a push. Uh, you, you need to click a, a, a footer button for finally complete the push. So this way, uh, the maintainer receive, will receive the, the call to uh, the final check, basically of your push and decide if it's good or not, if accept it or not. As Jim said, you have the description file when you push it, uh, some notes that contains some new packages that are not in the description file because here you see there is a description file. This description file contains a list of the um packages that have been used within the notes of the okay if your notes contains a new package you need to add add it in here just you can do it from github just click here and edit the file okay you edit the file like this blah 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 um you have done something, then propose the changes because you update the description, that's fine. And this will go, you see, you directly, you're making changes and this will go directly to the, for, for revisit, for being revisited. Okay, any other questions? I don't know if I've answered. That's a good, that's a good overview, okay. thank you. Sorry about, so everyone can do it. If you don't want to make any changes, you can just push uh, a new file. Uh, no, sorry, not push, but knit a new R markdown. So you have it blended with the others. Okay, for presenting it. And then you work it out what how to blend it with the, the main ones. Okay, maybe talk it with John and say, I don't know, I push something, see if you like, if it's good, I don't know. Any questions? You have taken too much time, so. <laughs> we're, we're Sorry. Good. We're good. <laughs> All right, with that, um, I've taken the screen back and, uh, um, Let me adjust things so I can see you and the content. <laughs> All right, so where we left off last week, um, we, we walked through the content of the chapter, of course, on um, uh, uh, different, different kinds of, uh, like the goal of machine learning and parametric, non-parametric models, supervised, unsupervised, so kind of some table stakes. Um, and there was a whole section on assessing goodness of fit or model accuracy or, or other measures. And, and, and now we're in exercises. 
Um, I, I added the exercises. I guess they hadn't been part of the prior notes. So uh, this content is new to this co cohort. Uh, we can go through it as slow or fast as, as you want. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to prompt some discussion, I guess. If you disagree, that's, that's, that's great. In fact, we, we learned that way. Um, so we had talked about number one last week um, and the conceptual content. Um, I guess we're down to exercise two, uh, where they're asking us for, for these scenarios to, to say, is it classification or regression? And then are we interested in inference or prediction? Okay. Four axes here. And then finally, uh, a, a number of observations and a, and a, and a P, a, a number of uh, predictors. Uh, their first example is a, a set of data on 500 firms where they're looking at uh, profit, number of employees, industry, and CEO salary. And, and they're looking at understanding which factors affect the CEO salary. So, so my answer here was uh, because salary is a number that that's a regression and we're interesting in inferring the, the components of, of the CEO salary. Our N here is five, five, excuse me, 500 for firms. And our, our P, let's see if I got this right. Oh yeah, the number of predictors, in, in this case, I'd counted three independent predictors and one dependent variable. I don't know if that's how we count P's here. Um, are, are we good with that? Okay, so moving on. Uh, B, we're gonna launch a new product and we're looking at success or failure. We collect data on 20 similar products and we measure uh, success, failure, price charged, budget, competition price, and 10 other variables. Um, so I, I wrote here, this is binary classification. Um, and the way I read it, specifically prediction. So our N is the 20 similar products and our P, if I did this right, was, was 13 independent predictors. So far so good. Okay, and C, we're interested in predicting um, a percent change in exchange rates in relation to world stock markets. Uh, so they collect weekly data for all of 2012. Sounds like 52 weeks to me. For each week, they have the percent change in the exchange rate and then percent changes in uh, something related to US market, stock market, uh, British stock market, and maybe the, the, the German stock market. Uh, I had said, because it's a percent change, here again, it would be a kind of regression problem and, and a prediction only. Uh, the P are the four uh, stock markets. Oh, the three stock markets, um, I, you know, I got this wrong. It should be three if I'm counting the same way. So my mistake. And the N is 52 weeks. I guess, are we on the same page with that? Uh, Jim, right. I just I, I just would add that this is this probably will be a time series uh, regression problem. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a good point, and because it's percentage yeah. change, because it's, um, that's, a, that's a time component there. Yeah, both time series, and then um, it it uh, right this so both time series, and then. Um, because it's relative percent, there may be some other distribution that applies rather than normal or Gaussian. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And I think that's in other chapters. So <laughs> it's foreshadowing, I suppose. All right, question three. I, I uh, got my um, highlighter out. It's great. Um, this was going back to the question of bias, variance, training error, and testing error. Um, 
it's even better like on a dry erase board, right? Um, so I drew this illustration. It has, um, you know, oh yeah, count it as five curves if, if the black is a curve. <laughs> so um, uh, model complexity goes along the x-axis or the, say the number of splines that you add. And, and the y-axis up and down is uh, the error rate or um, the sum of variance and bias. You can think of that as an error rate. So um, maybe the two curves to look at first, um, the yellow line here would, would be this training set mean squared error. It's, it's not unusual on a training set to see error rates go down and down and down as you fit tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, the green in this illustration is a testing set error rate. Because we're overfitting the training set, at some point, we're, we're really not improving the performance of the holdout data. So we get this characteristic U-shaped curve in this regression. Um, and to explain the components of, or the difference between the training set and testing set, um, there's three concepts in the book uh, to review. There's um, this idea of bias in blue. Um, so, so that is if we if if we have curved, uh, you know, a a, a curved data set. Um, something that looks cubic, something, and we try to force a line through it. Um, if there's a lot of remaining information, a lot of bias that isn't gonna come through in the model. The brown on the other hand is error rate due to variance and, and largely due, due, due to overfitting. And, uh, and the black is the irreducible error that no model is 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 uh, is 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 going to pick up. Um, it's funny the the irreducible could be in data sets where at the same x value you have two y values. You know you're just never going to get a single prediction of that. I, I have a quick question. If we can go back up so we can see this, yeah. Watch me try and do this. Does this work? Can you see this? Yes. Cool. Uh, so the difference between here our bias and our testing training set mean squared error is that due basically to the irreducible error. So you've drawn this curve as less steep than this one. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I guess I had I, I was wondering if there's any as... reason for this. I, I had interpreted it as the, the green line, the test is, is, is sort of the sum between a brown, blue and black. The sum of them is green, is, is the way I had thought of it. Um, I guess, is that quite right? Sorry, how did you, uh, how did you make uh, it? It's under, it's at view options annotate. Yes, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so this, the difference between these two lines basically, which is in yellow, we have our, the error we can get on our tra training set, right? Um, but our bias is always showing, I guess, a. Um, so as we get a more complicated model, more complicated model, the, the bias, is decreasing faster than the error is decreasing. All right, so this is what we see with the blue. Our bias is decreasing faster than our error is increasing. And I guess the difference that our error isn't like totally matching our bias is due to the fact that we have the irreducible error. Is this an accurate mental model of it? Oh, everyone's so silent. <laughs> yeah, 
I think yeah, I, I, I kind of um, pretend, pretended the yellow curve wasn't there at all. Um, cause, cause your, your, your goal in machine learning is, is to be able to say something about unseen data. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you craft a model and you're going to apply that in the future. So I, I, um, I, uh, I, I guess in, in, in a practical sense, when I do train a model, I see things like that yellow curve, but I know not to count on it. Right. So we should even Just, pretend that our yellow curve is kind of irrelevant because we know that if we try to minimize too deeply our yellow curve, we'll get this green problem. Yeah. So I, I, I think the it's, it's actually describing our green situation, you know, what we deliver to the business or to, to our organizations on, on, they will see the green mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and they won't be happy if we, if we overfit. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Uh, uh, Jim, you, you talked last time about the underfitting and overfitting, right? A phenomenon. Right. Recharge it, battery. It, it, so, sorry, it's my speaker that is, is acting up. Yeah. So, for example, you know, when this green line and the yellow, you know, follow more or less the same slope, okay, you know, the the model is trying to, you know, try, try, trying to reach a point where it can predict the test data uh, in a, you know, without the noise, okay? You know, try, trying to get the actual data that is producing the actual results. What happens is that because of the nature of, of the algorithm, if you keep, you know, uh, optimizing that train set, is going to incorporate noise. Okay, so when it 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 it, it, it gets out of, uh, out of out of control, uh, you know, adding noise, then you see that it, it doesn't generalize. So you see that curve in the green, in, in the green, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, in, in the green points, the testing points, you see it that then it, it again go, goes, goes up. So there's a, you know, and, and, and the point that basically there's a balance between the training and the test set is that intersection between bias and barriers. That's the balance that you're trying to achieve. And usually that balance, that intersection coincides with the low point, with the low, with the optimal point of the testing data. In other words, your model cannot improve more than that. Mm-hmm. Okay, with the data that you have, of course, you know you can do all, all sort of things to improve that. But right now, with the data that you have and the features that you have, that's the optimal point. Okay, so if you go to the left, you are underfitting. If you go to the right, you are overfitting. Okay. And for me, that's the most, you know, important Recharge thing. Battery. Sorry, sorry about the speaker. Uh, this is the most important point of the, you know, of the graph. Okay, to understand the under and overfitting and what it is your model, you know, uh, uh, doing. Okay. So, uh, one, and usually, more, it's, it's, yeah. and usually, it's, it's not that apparent. Sometimes, you know, you get these curves. Okay, when you get like something like lo- local optimus. Okay, but then you have to keep, you know. Keep understanding your model so that you can reach the global, the global optimum. Okay, and, and, so, and it's not easy. And so, what what you can do? You change the type of model. Change Excuse me. Model. What what can yeah. you do uh, to, to make it better? Change the type of model. Uh, uh, well, you, you you can train the different models. That's yeah, one thing you can, that you can. Yeah. Do. Okay. Then the other thing that you can do is uh, get more data. Okay, if you can, oh, okay. okay, get more data maybe. because probably maybe that data that you have is not, you know, a clean data or it's not a representation of the population. The other thing that you can do is get more features, okay? Mm-hmm. And that's why feature engineering is, the, is one of the things that usually, you know, wins competitions, okay? Because okay. let's say that you have a finite data, you know, you can do anything more, you, can, you cannot get more data. You can train different models, but different models are going to reach a global optimum. So the way that you can then improve that model is to add features, okay? Do, do feature engineer, add features, and then 
try to run it. And well, maybe you can fission, get fission you know, incremental. Means, sorry, fission engineering uh -huh. means um, data wrangling, basically. So adapting yeah. uh, your data yeah. more closely to, to your needs. Right. So yeah, like try, try, try to get more features out of the predictors that you already have, okay? Yeah. And, and you can you can get creative, you know, on that in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> and and I think in some ways we're we're jumping into um, the chapters that are coming, right. which is really wonderful. I, I I think our enthusiasm for the material is is here. So, um, but I I think I think um, oddly we we don't often see the brown or the blue, uh, you know, unless you knew the data generating process. What you'll see is a test set error and a training set error, and and they'll be out of whack. And and this is just an explanation about what's going on under the hood. Um, but very good discussion, uh, and and Ricardo, thank thank, thank you. you for framing it that way. All right, I'm going to move a little more quickly. Um, we're we've got a little more than 15 minutes left. Um, I, I think we covered you know, explain why the curves have the shape they do. Um, so I'd like to step into some of the real life applications, the, the things you've been handed. So in problem four, um, it, it asks, this is a fill in the blank, describe three real life applications with classification. Um, talk about the predictors that might be available and then is it inference or prediction? So uh, in my world, um, a conversation I've had was, um, I talked to a supply chain person uh, about their expedited freight problem. They, they have this responsibility for DHL, FedEx, and people flying parts all over the world. And they don't know why. <laughs> so, um, we, we were going to, to explore the primary causes of expedited freight. So this is confer, uh, uh, infer, uh, inference, excuse me. Um, in the data set, we could um, provide for all the transportation. We could include country of origin, um, shipping methods. So the original shipping method like sea freight, for example, uh, a promised lead time, and then any like factory schedule changes or, or demand schedule changes. Um, so, so this, and, and some of these are categorical variables. So this would be to identify which categories lead to the most expedited freight. Um, another one uh, with a marketing person, um, the question was, um, well, okay, I, I, I stretched a little bit here, but customer churn seems to be pretty common in, in marketing circles to identify for existing customers, how many will you lose? And um, it, it could be for a education program, like a, a subscription month to month where, where the monthly subscription just disappears. And the independent predictors, um, this, this just could be the prediction of how many people do you lose. So you could have your monthly payment history, like a time series, uh, maybe the content of your courses, and uh, even like the, the click habits of your customers, the, the, the uh, uh, conversion rates or other website visit information. And then the last, um, so, so that's a classification, churn or not. Uh, the last classification that, that is, is fun at some point is to take hand, handwriting samples and predict what letter that is. Um, so depending on the alphabet, it could be 26 classified letters. And the independent predictors, if you've got image data, it's the pixels on the images. I guess, are there other uh, good classification examples? I just wrote in the chat, you know, that that problem about the uh, deciphering the, the letter, you know, handwritten, uh, there's a famous uh, data set, it's the MNIST data MNIST, set. Yeah. Yeah, and you use it usually to learn about uh, deep learning. 
Yeah. It, 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 most of the time it shows up, you know, in deep learning uh, tutorials. Nice. So <laughs> I, I think one that I've come across for a classification problem that people do quite a lot in the medical thing, where you tend to be, you are, of course, interested in predict in being able to predict things, but less so is mostly inference. So I think about mm -hmm. people who respond or don't respond to drugs or yeah. to a certain cancer treatment or something like this. Often, right. you know, you want to know respond or not respond, but it tends to be a, a backwards looking thing. So you have an understanding of like, who's a responder, who's a not responder, less, less so interested in prediction, more interested in inference in, inference. in my experience. Yeah. An example that comes to mind, I've, I've kind of dealt with this more in, in classes for my master's program in a higher education setting is basically where the classification is success or not success or like such as like passing a class or not. And I used a data set that had a lot of independent variables. There's some more demographic of the students, some were uh, motivation factors. They had done like some surveys and, and, and motivation factors like do people feel like the class is valuable to them? Um, are they are they going to college or not? It was like for high school students, and like so, you know, perhaps someone who indicates they're going to college is going to be more successful than not. Um, and also like performance data on like if they failed classes in the past, which of course was was pretty high. Um, and so then, uh, and one of the data sets is actually regression and was just the actual grade of. Uh, but then you know, in some cases, you might just sort of predict whether someone's successful or not, or that could come up in like HR type data of like, is your applicant gonna be a success as defined by are they with the company in a year or something like that? That's good, thank you. Okay, um, just moving on to regression um, uh, examples. Um, one of my favorite uh, where I work is survival. Um, also comes up in the epidemiology in the medical world, but in, but in my case, it has to do with uh, uh, the life of component parts on vehicles and warranty claims and alarms and, and events like fault codes, check engine lights, that sort of thing. And so survival rate is what part of the population is still in service, is not dead yet. Um, so, <laughs> um, um, it's, it's censored data that we, we uh, if it's still in service, it just hasn't yet had a warranty claim or hasn't died yet. Uh, the independent predictors are things like the vehicle's engine hours, um, uh, the region of the vehicle or state or country, uh, maybe the configuration of the car or the machine, um, and then even in the duty cycle, the application, um, in my case, the type of farmer, but survival rates and, and the part of the population that's left and the model of what we anticipate in the business is a really hot topic. Um, another uh, uh, fun data set uh, for teaching is uh, there's a wine data set where you try to predict the price of a bottle of wine with the vintage year, the type of the grape, the region, the color of the bottle, and even the length of the story on the label. And, and that, that's, a, that's a fun data set if you've not seen it. And then the last is a, is a count um, prediction or another regression for, um, for a web portal storefront. You know, this, this is marketing analytics again. Um, for a catalog of products, the layout of the website, uh, uh, the colors, you know, what kind of blue or what kind of red you used and, and other dimensions of the shopping experience. I guess, are there other good examples of regressions that, that you encounter? Or maybe should I should move on quickly to uh, cluster analysis? I'll do that. Cluster analysis. So I, I don't get involved much in unsupervised. I kind of steer clear of it because there's so much subjectivity. It's, it's like an ink blot. Somebody says, make me a chart that looks like this. And I'm a little worried about trying to add value that way. Um, but I, I know in 
in our market research kind of group, they, they try to identify personas like a typical customer within a cluster. And, and so in market research, they will cluster customer behaviors and, and then name those people so they can design for those people's needs. Um, here again, I, I've used personas even in duty cycles. Um, you know, in IoT and in Internet of Things, when you look at machine data, sometimes you group or cluster the behavior of customers and their needs. And then, um, all right, in leadership training, in human resources, um, there's data sets available related to how much you chat and how much you use the phone and some of your other employee behaviors. And... Um, in, in thinking about training needs for a group of employees, you might cluster your employer employees into buckets to think about uh, how you meet different, again, a personas, employee needs. I, I guess, are those pretty good examples of clustering or do you have better ones? Maybe not so bad. So, so the one I think I think Spotify works on a clustering mechanism to do music recommendations. So that's how I think the Discover playlist works. If anybody has Spotify, uh, they do this really cool thing based on the music you're listening to. They'll give you like playlists of like songs that you like that cluster together. You'll, they'll give you a Discover thing, which I think is is probably just a compliment, complicated K-means clustering is my guess. Yeah, I, I think you're right. That's a great example, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, how do they know? Well, I, I guess they know what is good or right if you just stay on the site. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, moving quickly. We've got seven minutes left. I, I do have a hard stop at 11. So um, I, I think last time we talked about uh, flexible versus less flexible approaches and under what circumstances would a flexible approach be preferred? I, I just simply said that the, the very flexible, the complicated, uh, you know, XGBoost and neural nets require a lot of data and end up being less interpretable or ex explainable to a, a lay audience. And um, often a bank or a highly regulated entity will prefer a simple linear model or a decision tree. So it's, it's very clear for that policy making body what the algorithm is doing. Just, just kind of two examples. Similarly, on the differences between parametric and non-parametric learning approaches, uh, the parametric approach, uh, like linear regression or ordinary least squares, um, the assumption is that there's a functional form, that, that there exists a line <laughs> or you know, a, a collection of splines that represents the, the true, um, you know, functional form of that data. A huge advantage is explainability. Um, you can talk about slope or uh, even um, confidence intervals are easier to explain, I think, in, in a parametric model. Um, and in a way, less data is required because you're, you're you're spanning the line through the through 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 the empty spots. Um, a disadvantage, though, is is it, it may never achieve the lowest possible error rate, um, uh, and and some clients want that last fraction of a percent on accuracy. Okay, moving on quickly, they've got a, a K nearest neighbors um, example here. I sketched out the math, but um, this uses Euclidean and distance. So it's the sum of squares, um, square root, and, and to get the distances between all the points. And, and they ask, so in K and N, when K is one, um, let's see, what was the question here? Oh, make a prediction for why. 
um, so make a prediction of the color when k is one. And and I said I said green here because um, uh, the the one that influences or the only one that counts is the one nearest to it. When k is three, it ends up being the the um, the three nearest determine what the prediction of y is. And then they talk about the Bayes decision boundary. Um, and, and if you've got a highly nonlinear uh, situation, um, I, I sit here, small k values yield the model with a, a lot of detail in the curves be, because you, you, you're skipping from stone to stone in the pond. And uh, likely the lowest irreducible model, but, but it's the most complicated model. Three minutes left. I want to show you something fancy. So in this applied uh, exercise, um, they, uh, they read in a college data set and um, they actually say to, to run the pairs on a, a sort of facet plot. So you see every feature paired with every other nu numeric feature. And, and, and pairs is a handy, handy like, base R function, um, but I threw in uh, ggpairs, which is a, a, an adaptation of ggplot that does what pairs does with, with some other um, uh, nice benefits. I guess, have you all worked with gg or gggalley? Everybody has? Okay, all right. I, um, anyway, I, I I really think these are beautiful graphs and, and uh, there's a lot going on. So I'd never show them to a client, but I, I use them for me. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've got the same view. Um, I, I really thought it explains the correlations and, the, and, and how the, uh, uh, say this is, this is uh, uh, private schools are the color. Uh, so public private. Um, and, 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 and how they differ from one another for each of the numeric variables. Uh, a, a simple uh, box plot then also can be made um, um, in base R, which is plot, but in ggplot, it, it requires a little more typing, but it, it's, it's a nice, nice chart. And then, um, Actually, they ask here to, to make a new variable called elite, uh, where uh, these are the schools that are in the top half of the top 10%. And uh, so I added that to the college data set and, and made a box plot of, uh, of the out of state um, numeric variable for, for the new categorical variable. Uh, just quickly, um, that, that's an example of feature engineering. Uh, ah, okay? yes, yes. You yes. know, creating a feature from the features that you have. And usually, you know, if it is done properly, uh, it, it aids, you know, your interpretation and your, you know, your model, you know, uh, overall rate. Okay. Um, I have just one minute left and then I have to jump off. Um, this material is is out. Um, it's checked back in to, to R4DS, so, so you all can fork and pull it in. Um, I, I guess we're on chapter three next week. Is that correct, Federica? Um, should we decide on a, on a presenter in the, in the time we have left? Uh, I think uh, I'm on a social media. Yeah, that, that, that will be me. We, we have no meeting for next week. So it's, it's okay. Ricardo and it's what week? Uh, we're starting January. again on January 6th. January Wonderful. 6th. Okay. All right. Thank you everybody, I guess, for, 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 for listening. Because I'm sorry I didn't to... get to the very end, but. Uh, because you need to go, isn't it? Yeah. To... Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Stuff online. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>